Isabella d'Este was born on March 17, 1474 in Ferrara, a city in northern Italy. She was the firstborn child to Ercole d'Este, the Duke of Ferrara, and Eleanor of Naples, who was the daughter of the King of Naples. Her sister, Beatrice, was born a year after her, and she also had four younger brothers. Thanks to her noble status, she had a great education growing up. Her father made sure her and her sister got the same education as their brothers did. By the age of six, she spoke Latin and Greek fluently. She studied Roman history and literature, and Isabella was also educated in music, singing, and dance. She played the lute, which was a very popular instrument during the medieval and renaissance period. At a young age, she would often sing and dance and entertain the court when ambassadors or diplomats would visit. So because of this, she would grow up spending time around scholars and people with political power, which would serve her well in her future. Art was another subject she was educated on, of course. Her mother might have inspired her to not only collect art, but to create her own art as well. At the age of six, Isabella was betrothed to Francesco Gonzaga, who was eight years older than her. He was the son of the Marquess of Mantua and was described as short, pop-eyed, snub-nosed, and exceptionally brave. He was even regarded as one of the finest knights in Italy. She spent the years before marriage getting to know her future husband. They would write letters to each other. He would write her poems and send her gifts, which she appeared to treasure. And soon enough, she began to admire him and enjoy his company. And this in turn led to love. Ten years later, just shy of her 16th birthday, on February 11th, 1490, 15-year-old Isabella d'Este married Francesco Gonzaga. By this time, Francesco had become the Marquess of Mantua, which made Isabella the Marchioness of Mantua. A grand celebration was held to celebrate the union. Isabella rode through the streets on a horse draped in gems and gold. The celebration also included an extravagant banquet after the wedding ceremony. After the ceremony, she made the move from Ferrara to Mantua to be with her husband, although he spent much of his time away since he was general of the armies of the Republic of Venice. To make the palace feel more like home, she began to decorate, hanging paintings on the walls and displaying various pieces of art, both current and from earlier years. She even created her own private studio to continue creating her own work. This room was called the Studiolo and was decorated with commissioned work from Andrea Mantegna, Pietro Perugino, and Lorenzo Costa, who would become the court painter. The paintings were mostly mythological panel paintings, which would serve as muses. Now, during this time period, it wasn't common for women to have studiolos. They were usually had by men so they could spend some private time reading and writing. Isabella didn't just make herself a studio, however, she also made herself a grotta, which was the space where she kept many of her collectible items. The grotta was on the floor directly below the studio and was decorated with green and red walls, wooden ceilings with gold trim, gems on the panels, lush rugs throughout, and marble door frames. It was her own personal retreat displaying her most prized possessions. One of those items being a gold medal with emeralds and rubies and her name spelled out in diamonds, which she kept in a gold frame decorated with precious gems. She also had other apartments given to her by her husband that she could use for art. Those were decorated with frescoes on the walls and ceilings with gold inlay. Francesco was also a patron of the arts, although not quite as much as her and with a different style, but he supported her in every way when it came to her passion for the arts. Isabella became a patron of many artists like Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and countless other Renaissance artists, including sculptors, writers, and architects. And she wasn't just a patron, she also became friends with some of them as well. She exchanged letters with Leonardo for over six years after his visit to Mantua. She would often ask him to create a portrait of her from a charcoal sketch he made while visiting her in 1494. It was her favorite portrait of herself, although it was unfinished, but he was too busy with all his other works and commissions to make it into a painted portrait for her. 
One of the paintings for her studiolo was Parnassus by Andrea Mantegna. Painted in 1496, it's been interpreted as a celebration of her and her husband's marriage. It includes the figures of Venus and Mars standing atop a rocky arch as the muses dance below. Venus, the goddess of love, would be Isabella and Mars, the god of war, would be Francesco. Parnassus was meant to be part of a series of paintings, but Mantegna only completed one other piece, Triumph of the Virtues. Here, Isabella would be depicted as Minerva, the goddess of war and wisdom. And once this painting was completed, Isabella decided that she wanted to move on to a newer style of work from newer artists. So Mantegna was never able to complete the series. Isabella had a very strong personality and was said to have been a bit difficult when working with artists. She would give them extensive instructions, strict deadlines, and would sometimes even threaten to refuse payment if she wasn't happy with the work. For example, in 1505, she argued with Perugino, who painted the battle between love and chastity, that Minerva should never be depicted naked. She also showed her disappointment in that it wasn't painted in oil. So needless to say, this upset some of those artists as they weren't accustomed to having a woman have so much control over their work and artistic freedom. But these commissioned works were very important to her as they would be tied to her personal and, as time went on, her political affairs. They would in a way help separate her from her husband and give her a public image that would gain her the respect of the people in a different way. She went as far as even commissioning a work from Lorenzo Costa that would depict her being crowned alone without her husband. This work is known as the Allegory of Isabella d'Este's Coronation and was basically made to make the people of Mantua feel that she was capable of bringing peace and harmony as regent ruler. In the beginning, her commissions were to represent her with courtly elegance and as years went on, she began to request more mythological allegories. This was not a common theme for women or anyone really to commission at this time. Religious subject matter was far more popular during this time period, and women typically went for religious paintings or a simple portraiture. Isabella was often described as a beautiful woman, graceful with blonde hair and dark brown eyes. She was very much concerned with her looks and would even make sure to point out when a portrait wouldn't quite look like her or if the portrait made her look heavier. It was said that no woman had been painted as much as Isabella was, but aside from just having her beauty shown in her portraits, she also wanted them to showcase her as powerful or to be able to be interpreted as such so that she may gain the respect she wanted from political leaders. And at least if that failed, she would have the respect of the art world. With her husband away on military duties most of the time, she wanted to make sure she had control over her public image as much as possible, especially once she had her first chance to rule Mantua after her husband was held captive for a few years. Isabella became a mother in 1493, about four years after her marriage to Francesco. She had a daughter who she named Eleonora after her mother who had died just before the baby's birth. And then she gave birth to another daughter in 1496, but she lived for less than two months. Although her husband loved his daughter very much, Isabella was a bit upset that she had not produced a male heir for him. She would even write to him after the birth of their second daughter, angry with him and even putting the blame on him. He didn't really care, though, because he just wrote back to her saying how he would have loved to have met his daughter and spend time with her. So this was just another example, maybe, of how Isabella was so concerned with her image. Maybe she was worried what people would think or say if she could not produce an heir. In the year 1500, she finally gave birth to a son and the future Duke of Mantua. It was no surprise that he would become her favorite child. She went on to have five more children, three girls and two boys, but one of those girls would only live to be seven. Francesco Gonzaga was captured and held captive in Venice by French forces in 1509. At this point, Isabella would become regent and serve as commander for the city's forces. She quickly learned the finances and politics and took charge of employees and everyone at her service. 
During her time as regent, she imposed strict budgets, which allowed her to save money and would in turn be used to purchase land that would earn her money. With this, she was able to upkeep the city and keep the citizens happy. And in 1512, she was able to negotiate a peace treaty, which provided her husband's safe return home. During this time, however, she began to see her marriage fall apart. The problems had already begun before he was captured due to his infidelity with other women and a relationship with Isabella's sister-in-law, Lucrezia Borgia. That relationship actually lasted for a few years and Francesco would eventually contract syphilis due to all his sexual relationships. But now that he had returned from Venice, the tension between them grew as he saw what a great leader to the people of Mantua she had been, a far better leader than he was. They began to live separately, again, really, since he hadn't been around often, and she was free to travel and live her own life as she pleased. In 1519, seven years after being freed from captivity, Francesco passed away. This left Isabella regent until her son was of age. Once her son, Federico, became of age, he opted to keep her around due to her popularity, knowledge, and great negotiating skills. These negotiating skills got her son, Federico, a change of title from Marquis to Duke, and her other son, Ercole, a role as cardinal. And eventually, she would be head of state of her own city-state in 1529. She continued to educate herself on agriculture, architect, and industry in order to be the best leader possible, and the people of Mantua loved her for that. She spent some time in Rome, which happened to be during the attack known as the Sack of Rome. During that attack, she was able to house over 2,000 people in her home in order to keep them safe. Her home was one of the only safe spaces in Rome during that attack, as her son was the general of the invading army. And after the attack, she was able to secure a safe passage for all those who were spared. In later years, she opened a school for girls and converted part of her palace into a museum so that she could showcase all of her favorite artists and collections. Isabella continued to rule over her city-state, Solarolo, until her death at the age of 64 on February 13, 1539. She was buried next to Francesco in the church of Santa Paola in Mantua. She left behind over 40,000 letters that documented her life, 28,000 of those being letters she received, and about 12,000 of those were copies of letters she wrote herself. Those all remain in Mantua today, and in some of these letters is where we see her talk about fashion and how she even claimed to have invented new trends, like certain headpieces and necklines on dresses. Despite being one of the most painted women of her time, there aren't many portraits of Isabella around today. As she grew older, she preferred idealized portraits instead of sitting for them, which is why you may see some differences in her appearance in some of the portraits. After her death in 1539, many artists and poets paid tribute to her. Some painted her and others wrote about her, referring to her as supreme amongst women, the wisest woman, and even the first lady of the world. So I hope you guys enjoyed hearing about Isabella d'Este. Her sister, Beatrice, was just as powerful of a woman and also made a big impact politically in Milan. If you want to hear more about the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, you can find me as History by Linny on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. I would love to see you guys there. And until next time, bye. 